Is this one working? This works. This works. This works. Ooh. Yes, I would say uh, that those people who were on team one should take the seat uh, at the front and anybody else who fits from the rest of the group can join us as well. And then we can rotate out after the first hour. So um, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for showing up after lunch so promptly. That's a challenge. I am William Drake from the University of Zurich uh, in Switzerland. And this is NetMundial Plus Five, the legacy and implications for future internet governance. It's a session sponsored by uh, CGI.br, who were of course the secretariat of the NetMundial meeting five years ago, as well as three German-based organizations, EuroSIG, the European Summer School, um, DINIC, and the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. Um, in April 2014, for those who don't recall, Representatives of governments and stakeholders from around the world uh, came together in Sao Paulo, Brazil to negotiate the Net Mundial Statement on Global Internet Governance. Uh, the statement was a non-binding, bottom-up, open and participatory uh, created document, uh, which was really a first of its kind um, that was intended to help shape the evolution of the internet governance ecosystem. The statement had two parts, uh, one which was a set of internet governance principles and the other which included a so-called roadmap for the future evolution of internet governance. Um, at the time, for those of you who were around back then, you will remember that the Net Mundial was a big deal. Um, it came on the heels of the ITU, the International Telecommunication Unions World Conference in International Telecom, where we had the biggest diplomatic catastrophe in the history of international communications policy um, and a breakdown of cooperation that resulted in a, a treaty that half the members didn't support um, and the Snowden revelations. So it was a very tense time uh, and uh, Fadi Shahadi, who was at that point the uh, CEO of ICANN, went to Brazil to meet with the Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff after she'd given a speech in the UN General Assembly calling for a new multilateral approach to internet governance to convince her that we should have a multi-stakeholder meeting to try to sort all these things out. And it really was an important thing. It was the first real multi-stakeholder decision-making type process on broad internet governance. That is to say, not just names and numbers and the things managed by the ISTAR community, the technical infrastructure and so on, but also a wide range of other issues as well. And of course, since then, we have had a number of other efforts to do multi-stakeholder initiatives of various kind, many of which are being announced at this uh, event. So we had, uh, I would call them multi-stakeholderism by invitation. Uh, they were generally uh, projects uh, that produced reports with recommendations and things like that. You've had things like the, the Guterres high-level panel, uh, the, the Internet and Jurisdiction Projects uh, outputs, the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, uh, and various others that are releasing reports here. Uh, but the Net Mondial was a real open, bottom-up decision-making process where a text was adopted. Uh, come on up if you want, Jeanette. Um, right off the plane. Um, uh, where we actually did something in the way of making decisions on a multi-stakeholder basis. What we've seen evolve since then mostly has been more like intergovernmentalism plus, which is to say intergovernmentalism with a greater level of multi-stakeholder input 
but in terms of multi-stakeholder decision making, not much has really happened. So it really seemed like it didn't make sense to let the Net Mundial's five-year anniversary go by without commenting on it and reflecting on what it uh, indicated for the future evolution of internet governance. And the IGF is the right place to have this conversation, obviously, in particular because I would argue some of the techniques pioneered in the Net Mundial could well be adopted by the IGF to great uh, ends. So uh, we decided to have this session. The purpose is not to have a bunch of veterans of the meeting sit around telling war stories to each other <laughs> about what happened, although that's tempting, um, but rather to try to look forward and assess what is the longer term implications of this, what have we done or not done to try to make the, the net deal process a substantial living thing in some manner rather than just a one-off event. To do that, we've decided to split the session into two halves. The first half will be chaired by my friend Wolfgang Kleinvector. Uh, that will look back at the meeting because some people here were not at the meeting. And even if you were at the meeting, you might need your memory refreshed as to what happened. So the first chunk of time we're going to spend talking about the Nut Mundial uh, event itself. Um, and then after that, we'll turn over to me and we will have a second part that's more forward looking. So we have two different teams of people uh, participating, and uh, on, on the first, yeah, it's, it's fine. By the way, I also want to mention uh, we have here uh, Mona Badran from the Cairo University as our remote moderator. If there are any people online who want to pose questions, uh, Mona will read them out to us when we come to that part of the session. So what we're going to do until uh, 1345 is talk about the Net Mundial meeting and the Net Mundial statement. And the lead participants on that uh, will be, and do we have the slides now? Are the slides showable? Uh, I put a PowerPoint slide in there. Where, did the guy leave? Ah, okay. And how do I go back? All right. So, all right. So, no, I'm good. So you can see here the list of participants: Carlos Afonso from Brazil. Fiona Alexander, formerly U.S. government, now academic. Vince Cerf, of course, from Google. Raul Echeverria wrote to me. Uh, he's going to be a little bit late. Henriette Esterhuizen is in the front row there and will come up later. Hartwood uh, Glasser from CGI.br. Jeanette Hoffman, who's next to me. Uh, Nana Nwakana, I always have trouble with her last name, who is also late but is coming. And Christoph Steck from Telefonica, all of whom were heavily involved in the process at the time. Um, and we're going to break into two teams. So on the first team uh, that will ha take the lead on the first part of the discussion, we have Hartmut, Raul, uh, Raul's not here yet, Carlos, Nena, who's, not, who's coming, and Christoph. So I turn it over to Wolfgang to uh, moderate this part of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And more or less, Bill has already summarized you know, the background of the Net Mundial, where it came from, and what we are planning to do here. And I remember also that uh, the whole conference was driven to a certain degree by the uh, Snowden case. And if uh, you remember, there were two prominent cases with interception into uh, telephones. That was the President of Brazil and the Chancellor of Germany. And that's why, you know, Germany and Brazil became in a certain way united in looking for uh, reactions and, 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 you know, moving forward. And, you know, one concrete outcome from this, this is partly forgotten, is not only the two documents which emerged from the Net Mundial Conference itself, but it, uh, the outcome was a resolution in the United Nations General Assembly which produced the, the new position of the Special Rapporteur for Privacy in the Digital Age. That means the reports which are now have stimulated the debate in the last three, four years from uh, Professor Katanaki, you know, are a result of this uh, German-Brazilian joint initiative. And that's why, you know, uh, our idea was uh, to start with two very brief interventions of the CEOs and or former CEOs of the registry of the two countries uh, which are managing the domain name system. And I would invite uh, first Jörg Schweiger from uh, Germany and then Hartmut Lasa uh, from Brazil to think, uh, to reflect a little bit about this, uh, um, uh, their approach and their reflection about it. And then we move into more the concrete details of uh, how uh, Net Mundial uh, was uh, 
uh, made. And uh, I'm also very happy that Jeanette is here because she was a member of the um, team who really drafted the document. And it would be very good if you could recollect your experiences in how to uh, uh, really formulate and draft a document in a multi-stakeholder environment. I think these are skills which are more than ever needed in, 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 in the years ahead of us. So uh, Jörg, uh, could you just uh, make some uh, short... Um, well, thank you, Wolfgang. I wasn't aware of the fact that I'm going to get such a prominent role and be the first one to uh, state something on, on Net Mondial. Well, um, to get back to the, the, the major point, what has Net Mondial really done for us? And I think the, the most important point that Net Mondial really done was to pave the way on showing us how a process for governments, governance on and of the internet could be shaped. And that for sure is a multi-stakeholder process. And furthermore, given the uh, global nature of the internet and the world's different jurisdictional frameworks and cultures, what Net Mundial described in addition for me was a way forward on how we can really achieve results. And these results actually are values, values we can refer to, result, values that are respected and accepted. And one thing we do have to do right now is build, build on these values we have been digging up at Net Mundial. Thank you. Probably I need to start with CGI first, uh, because CGI was one of the organizers of the event in Brazil. CGI is the multi-stakeholder uh, governance model in Brazil. Uh, we have 21 members on the board of CGI. We start 96 with this model, and CGI take care not only of the domain names and the assignment of IP addresses, but we have also other activities related to the internet, as in security department, department for statistics, uh, uh, and center for the development of applications in the web. And uh, Fadi uh, called us if we are ready to be partner in this Net Mondial activity. Uh, he visited uh, Dilma in September or. Yeah, September, October 2013, and then we decide together to organize this event. I take over the Brazilian side. CGI uh, supported uh, the expenses, half of the expenses, the other half of ICANN. And I need to, st to tell that Brazil 2009 decided to publish uh, 10 principles for the use of the internet. And we, on this time, when the Snowden affair starts 2013, we already have our proposal running in the, in the Congress that our uh, principles will be probably a new bill of rights for the internet for the Brazilian users. And this was a very good model because uh, 2013, 2014, uh, the Snowden affair pushed uh, this movement in a very, let's say, uh, aggressive way, so that on the opening uh, speech to, in April 2014, our president was able to officially announce that we have now a new Bill of Rights. And this was, let's say, the beginning of Net Mondial, April 2014. Another strong difference, uh, because we are a multi-stakeholder model, we use uh, also a multi-stakeholder discussion model. We have four different lines in the auditorium, uh, uh, one line for government, one line for uh, industry, one line for academics and technical people, and one line for the NGOs and the activists. And uh, everyone needs to wait before it was his turn. So we use a very, let's say, dynamic process. We have more than 50 hubs connected 
overseas from all parts of the world, so that we have probably uh, three, four, five hundred uh, people participating uh, from overseas. In the total, we have thousand people present in Sao Paulo, and uh, all the discussion was not only was not only during the two days. The discussion starts sixty days before, because everyone could send proposals. We, ha we have a platform. This platform was uh, every two, three days. Uh, uh, reviewed and sent again to our participants. So when we start with the event, uh, the first day, we already have 90% of the conclusion ready, and then the final negotiation uh, run during the two days. Uh, my big surprise, uh, because we have the principles already used in Brazil, that we have more than 100 countries present, and that we have a very good final agreement on the uh, Sao Paulo Declaration. And now we have this document, let's say five years old, and we can compare what happens in 2014 and what we can do now in 2019. My, my personal uh, feeling is that this was the first time that we have this amount of uh, countries coming together to discuss the best way how we can use the internet in a very, let's say, cooperation manner. The multi-stakeholder model is uh, a winner, is a win-win solution for everyone, and our dream is that we, in the next five years, can see more progress coming uh, using this model. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hartmut. And you know, if you look backwards, sometimes you see only after a couple of years clearer what was the outcome. And if I look backwards the last 20 years, I see we had some milestones in the never-ending process towards internet governance. And the, uh, uh, the first milestone was certainly the definition of internet governance in the Tunis agenda, which introduced the principle of multi-stakeholder approach. But at this time in Tunis 2005, nobody you know, uh, had really a clear and precise understanding what the principle means, what multi-stakeholderism is. And the big achievement of Net Mundial in my eyes was with the eight principles and the very specific specification, you know, what a multi-stakeholder approach is, is that the uh, Net Mundial gave us a definition of what multi-stakeholder approach means. So this is very concrete and in so far I'm very happy that Janet is here because she was part of the drafting team who produced the language, and uh, even Janet is part of the second team, I think this would be the right moment that uh, Janet uh, a little bit recollects her experiences with you know, how such a document could be produced in this multi-stakeholder environment. And by the way, I just want to point out, I put on the slide yeah. here, the information from Joanna's chapter, uh, uh, the number of participants, the online consultations, the comments, so you get a sense for what the buildup of this was. It was a very big, uh, multi-global, open, bottom-up process. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, Indeed, the, the outcome documents were the result of several drafting processes, some of them starting way before the meeting. Then uh, in the days before the meeting, we had the first uh, drafting process at the venue. Then we had a public drafting process that I think had five lines because also remote participation had its own slot. And I found that quite efficient that we had very sort of short speaking slots and they moved from stakeholder to stakeholder to remote participation. So the documents went through several loops and in the end we had a non-public drafting session which I found most interesting. It was chaired by Henriette and me. Henriette um, chaired hmm? You chaired um, the, uh, the drafting of the principles, and I think I chaired the, the uh, roadmap. But what really matters, I think, that it was new for the internet governance space, for governments and non-governmental actors to coming together and really agree on a text. Um, that might have happened before in other global governance areas, perhaps environmental policy is more used to this because it started much earlier, but for the internet governance area, that was really new. And 
Um, I would say that we actually managed this, had a lot to do with friendly governments, among them the Brazilian governments, who made it clear to us what sort of the corridor for a document would be. It had to be based on agreed language. We couldn't go beyond language agreed in UN documents. We, as NGO and academic people, did not know exactly what agreed language would be. We were really dependent on people who would tell us what kind of uh, history of documents was there we could build on. And that wasn't always easy. I remember that particularly language surrounding mass surveillance it was very important for civil society to get this in, also for the whole human rights uh, community being present, but there was only limited language that we could use. So we were negotiating texts again and again and again. And I remember that the Brazilian government helped us very much by also calling people and uh, who were more privy with the documents and made it clear to us what we could agree upon. I learned a lot also technically from this meeting because I understood how documents are actually developed and how you make progress. So for the people uh, being involved in this process, that was really, really interesting. And this, I would say the sad part of the story is that we could not practically build on this in the way of that we repeated this and sort of started innovation process for other venues. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, and another person who was involved in making uh, the document was uh, Carlos uh, Afonso. He was a member of the uh, board of CCIBR. Yeah. And uh, so, um, Carlos, um, can you reflect a little bit about yes, this well, history? Uh, I'll try. Hi, everyone. I, I will try to avoid repeating uh, things that have already been said and will be said. Uh, it's interesting that uh, I, I, list, I listed in an article I wrote for the Wolfgang's book, which you all received, uh, 14 initiatives, processes, or events uh, related to internet governance from 2012. Most of them are ongoing, not, not, not stopped, like the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, which we started just before uh, the Net Mundial. But the, the ones that are ongoing all had uh, received, in some way, the impact of how Net Mundial was organized, the, the methodology, the way uh, uh, the, the organization of uh, remote participation was created and was established, and the methodology of accumulating information before the event and synthesizing the information and the opinions of so many people, hundreds of uh, opinions, to try to consolidate in a document to be submitted to that multi-stakeholder event in really equal participation. Like Fadi uh, Shehadeh like it to say, multi-equal stakeholder, which is very difficult to achieve. But we, at least in the discussions in the Net Mundial event, we achieved that. You know? uh, and uh, I, I would like to, to, to since I, I know that you are going to comment on all other aspects, one aspect of the, the documents of Net Mundial, which was, was quite interesting, considering the participation of so many governments in the, in the event and in, in the uh, production of that document, which is that uh, it specifically says that the uh, multi-stakeholder participation should go all the way up to and including decision making. And this is clear in the Net Mundial document, very clear. And the question is, after five years, is this, has this been achieved on a country by country basis, on a government by government basis? How, how, how far can the multi stakeholder process go to regarding decision making? You know? And perhaps one of the answers is how governments are tolerating or accepting advocacy from other sectors, from civil society, from the private sector, from the acad academia, in the elaboration, in the decision on their decision-making processes. Uh, if this is achieved in a, 
in a meaningful and effective way, we are responding to that agreement of the Net Mundial document in 2014. Thanks. I thank you, Carlos. I think, indeed, a Net Mundial was a pacemaker, but uh, looking backwards, I see a different differentiation in how many stakeholders see uh, the Net Mundial really as a success, and as I say, yeah, it was just a drop in the ocean. For instance, you know, the excitement is still on the side of the civil society, of the academic persons, also some technical groups are excited. Uh, private sector is, has a little bit mixed feeling, and governments, also if you look in the room now, there is only a very small number of governmental representatives here in the room at the moment. And when we tried already to organize some sessions in the last IGF in Paris, uh, you know, the reaction from governments was rather low. And uh, to give you just the personal experiences from September this year, when I was sitting in a meeting of the open-ended working group in the General Assembly of the United Nations, where they now just reinvent the participation of non-state actors in intergovernmental elaborations if it comes to cybersecurity. So that means if the governments are amongst themselves, so they have still five years after Net Mundial, a problem to open the door in a reasonable way to non-state actors. And in so far, the experiences of Net Mundial should be revitalized so, and, and, and present as a good example because this, the outcome was very constructive and it was not you know, destructive or it blocked further developments. And in so far, I'm very happy that uh, one representative of the private sector, Christoph from Telefonica, uh, is here also on the panel because Telefonica was very helpful both during Net Mundial and also afterwards. Uh, Christoph, what is your, your, your memory about Net Mundial? Well, th first of all, thanks for the invitation. And, uh, and I think my memory is quite good. Um, I think that uh, in its time, uh, it was really a miracle that Net Mundial somehow came together. I mean, we, we forget these things that five years from today, I mean, it's like in internet, everything's like three times as fast, so it's like, you know, a whole generation already. But, but it was a very specific time um, for the internet as well. I mean, there was after the Snowden revelations, um, there was, I think, the first kind of really huge wake-up call that some things were happening and, and people were not so happy about it. And, and so the question was, what can we do about it? And the situation in international politics was like today. I mean, it's not really working fast if it's working at all. So um, we looked for solutions. I think there was an idea in the room um, created by, by, by Fadi and ICANN and so on. And I think it was really a, a huge... Um, achievement by, by CGI and the Brazilian community to kind of take that idea and bring it down into something that had structure and a process. And I think that was also the reason why, for example, the private sector got interested in the whole process and also governments were interested because there was some form of structure. There was something you could, you know, basically there were some form of groups working on something, there were texts coming out and so on. And I think that was, that was really the, the, the key experience. It was uh, and this is not to diminish the IGF and what's happening here is fantastic, but it has a different role. The idea was to create something written, some form of principles, as you said, Wolfgang, to, to say what is multi-stakeholder? What is it really? Because everyone used that word and no one really could really define it. You know? and, and I think that was the key, key thing coming out. The principles, if you look at the principles, they're still totally valid. At least you know, the first part of the document, I think it has quite a timeless character. I mean, what's in there is still valid. You can read it today and we'll say, yes, fine. And still today, most stakeholders would agree that these are the principles. So I think that's, that's the, key, uh, the key outcome for me that using a multi-stakeholder organization like CGI, uh, well connected of course to the government, understanding also the governmental multilateral world, bringing in uh, really as far as possible people from around the world, working on one document. I mean, look at these numbers, uh, 1,300 people, I mean, that's like, half of the people here today working on one document. I mean, the, the, the energy was amazing. There was quite an energy. And, um, and also quite, uh, it was challenging. And I mean, <laughs> I know that the ones who were drafting, they, they, they had a very, very hard time. But um, I think in the end, the, the outcome is really worth it. And, and I feel that, um, you know, some of these things like the queuing in line, uh, equal footing, um, 
three minutes speaking time. I mean, all these kind of things, they were really quite nice, and people liked them, even governments liked them. Uh, I still remember, you know, some governments, very powerful governments, staying in line, waiting their turn, that, you know, uh, whatever other government was, was speaking, you know, three minutes, uh, and the same happening in all, this, uh, all, the, um, all the stakeholder groups. So, uh, for me, it was a huge achievement, and, and I really hope that some of these um, learnings can flow into what we now call the IGF+, Plus. I mean, maybe the next level of the, of the IGF. Thanks, Christoph. And uh, you represented a private sector, and the technical community was very crucial at, at this moment. And I remember that just a couple of months before the Sao Paulo conference in Montevideo, there was a big meeting where the ISTAR organizations uh, came together and said, we have a big trust problem. And, and, and I think it was the Montevideo statement which triggered to a high degree also uh, finally the Net Mundial. So that means the initiative came from the uh, technical community which said, okay, we can uh, survive with the internet only if we have this trusted network and we have to rebuild trust. And Raul was at this time, you know, <laughs> a key player in the technical community. This was your home country, Raul Echeverria. Thank you for coming and joining us here. And so we want to know something from your memory. <clears throat> thank you, Wolfgang. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, so um, as you mentioned, the Montevideo statement was a happy moment for the iStar community. Um, because we arrived to the meeting, okay, I didn't arrive because I was already there, but uh, when, when we got together for the, for the meeting, Everybody had something similar in mind. Okay, that's the time. That's the time we, we need to say something because we need to make the things to move uh, in order to make progress on the, in the IANA transition. Um, so that was a very happy moment. But uh, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the following two weeks, uh, a lot of things happened. In part because uh, we didn't know the plans of um, uh, Fadi Chehade to invite uh, Dilma Rousseff to organize the, uh, the meeting Net Mundial. And there were a lot of discussion in Bali during the IGF. And so uh, Virgilio invited me and, and Demi Gechko to co-chair the executive committee of Net Mundial. So it was, uh, I had to take a decision because I was a little upset uh, with uh, some parts of the processes after the Montevideo statement. But so we had to decide, uh, okay, what do we do? We just stay away from this meeting because it's not our meeting and we commit ourselves and do what, what we can achieve. Uh, fortunately, we uh, took the decision to, uh, to, to be part of the meeting, in part because uh, Virgilio Almeida, who was the chair of the, of the uh, Brazilian Internet Steering Committee at that time, was really a, a source of uh, trust. He was a kind of anchor in, in, the, in the trust anchor in the, in, the, in the process. So I felt very confident, and he talked to me and to, to them and said, you will lead the, the work of the executive committee, no restrictions. You, all, you only have to, to follow the, those principles, inclusion, transparency, participation, all, those, all the things that we know. So it's a, it's a first lesson that uh, when you try to, to build a, a bottom-up uh, process uh, without any antecedent, because it was the first time that we were doing that, it's always important to have a trust of function that can take decisions when needed. So we escalated the uh, problems, at, but somebody at, 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 that, at some point Brazilio had to make consultations with other um, partners and, and took the decisions. And we took another decision that was very important, that uh, Demi and me agreed that we would depart uh, from the scratch and we would not uh, start the process uh, based on an uh, already written uh, document. So, and it was a, a, a very important decision, I think, because that's the way that the community really felt involved in the process. The, we can say that the, that the document was really written uh, among thousand and something people. And, and we had to be very creative in the, in the, in the tools that so were needed in order to allow the participation of everybody. Other thing we, we decided is final dis discussions will happen during the meeting. It is not a kind of a governmental summit that when the, the people arrive into the, uh, into the meeting, the, so the, the documents are already uh, approved or adopted. So we wanted that the, the, the last round of discussions happen during the, 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 the meeting, so the meeting was really meaningful in the discussion. So there was a lot of lessons we learned in the, in the process. And um, I, 
I think that it was Wolfgang was speaking about the participation of different stakeholders uh, when I joined it. And I remember when um, uh, Benedicto, as the ambassador Benedicto Fonseca, he proposed the idea, that crazy idea of having the four uh, lines for to speak. I say, why? Because if not, the governments will not uh, probably will not feel enough uh, encouraged to participate to, to to speak. And so we didn't believe that really, but uh, we followed the Benedicto leadership and we accepted that. And what happened later? That's the 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 line of the governments was the line that had more people all the time, more people queued to speak. So I think that's, that uh, I remember Benedicto told me, I was hesitant if the, the governments would, be, would feel comfortable enough to speak, but let's see. <laughs> and, but I, probably that the idea was, I think that was a very practical thing, but that has a, 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 a huge implication, huge impact. And just to finalize, what we can learn from that? that still five years uh, after the, the Net Mundial meeting, there are things that we learn in the process that we have not applied enough yet. And in my comments uh, with regard to the digital cooperation um, it's, um, report and the, the uh, specifically about the IGF Plus, I, I included my recommendation that the, the, the Net Mundial style is the form that should have the, the high, high level meeting during the IGF. So if we could have a high level meeting at the end of IGF instead of at, at the beginning. With that format, where all the people, high-level people, is, uh, is really engaged in discussions, but meaningful discussions, and so I think that uh, we uh, could make a, a significant progress in the, in, in the production of outcomes. Remember, just to finalize, that the, uh, as far as I know, Net Mundial was the first time that outcomes were produced in a multi-stakeholder fashion without any formal negotiation, negotiation mechanism. What is really, I think, is amazing. I just want to add that the point that you're making about the linkage between the Net Mundial uh, methodology and the possible future of the IGF is something I want to probe in the second half of this session because it's something I've written about and I feel strongly too. The other thing, by the way, I just want to say, when you talk about the different lines that everybody had to wait for, the important point was the government people had to wait for that next line, right? The government people had to wait while the civil society people spoke, and then the technical community people spoke, and then the private sector people spoke, and then it came back to the government, which was, I think, very special. Anyway. Yeah, this was an interesting clash of cultures, but you know, this has innovated the processes, and we should really push for uh, this methodology because this would uh, you know, enrich the debate in the 2020. So we have 10 years ahead of us until we have the year 2030 with the Sustainable Development Goals. In between, we have the UN World Summit on the Information Society plus uh, 20. Uh, and, uh, but coming back and to close our uh, first part where we exchange memories, so I am very happy that Nana has now arrived because she gave such an emotional speech. And so uh, President <laughs> Rousseff just, you know, uh, went to you and said thank you. And, you know, what are uh, about your emotions? You are still live with these emotions. And you can you repeat, you know, to heat the room now, you know, with your emotions. Nana, thank you for being back on the podium here. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nenna. I come from the internet. But this time I'm just coming from the launch of the contract for the web. Uh, I still have uh, strong emotions about the Net Mundial. And if you want to leave with something from here, it's S-O-N, the sun, the spirit of Net Mundial. Okay. I'm going to confess, I was really interested in Net Mundial because I'm a soccer fan. And I wanted to visit Brazil first, tour around before the World Cup, and get, get a number, get it registered, so that when I hit the ground during World Cup, I'm, re I'm operational at the same time. That was one of the reasons. Personal, OK? <laughs> but the other thing was that, if you recall, we were moving from MDGs to SDGs. And the negotiations was on. And those who were negotiating, you recall that we had the principle, or, or, we wanted to call it transparency at that time. And we were fighting on it. It ended up being 
peaceful communities, goal 16 today, but we wanted that word transparency, we wanted rule of law in it and all of that. We did not get that, but we got the, the goal 16. Uh, so it was a point in time when everyone was saying something needed to be done around this. Um, then there is the work that CGI.br has done. I, I don't know if you've mentioned it while I was away. You know, all the time we've done the IGF, uh, because um, I want to pay homage to Anret, who is here. We had started the West Africa IGF, we had started regional IGFs here and there, and then we were struggling to let stakeholders at the regional and national levels understand that this is something that is multi-stakeholder. And we used to refer to what CGI.br CGI was doing, and then they pulled Net Mondial off, and we're like, heck, that is what you can do when you have a strong national IGF that is multi-stakeholder. So that, those, those were the emotions I was bringing. And then uh, the last one uh, was, I think it's been mentioned, when Dilma Rousseff signed the Marco Civil right there and then, I was like, yes, this is more of what we should be doing with IGF, decide something, work for it so that IGF will be a place where we can say, now we are ready to roll. So those were my emotions. And of course, I got, I got a hug from Dilma Rousseff. So that was great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Nena. We have uh, for the first part still 10 minutes for Q&A. You know, there are some people in the room who have also their very personal memories if they want to add something. Uh, you know, I, I will go around with the micro. And please, at your comments, uh, it's Stefano. Okay, uh, this net mondial is this net mondial is uh, a unique uh, occasion to do something special. Stefano Trumpi. Uh, I, at the time, I, I was uh, still uh, representing the, my government uh, with uh, in ICANN. And, uh, and so I had to report and uh, what, what Net Mundial was, was something unique. Um, and then uh, this uh, uh, came one year before the United Nations has to decide how long to prolong the, net, uh, the, the, the IGFs. And then uh, they decided to prolong for 10 years. That was something really, really excep exceptional because uh, never had uh, so long uh, prosecution. So then uh, il, uh, the, the idea of, of uh, agreeing on a document was a, a very uh, important. Uh, um, also because uh, uh, the, um, the uh, opinions concerning the, uh, the IGFs was connected to the fact that apparently IGFs didn't make decisions and uh, as only for reaching best practices, let's say. So, in, in, and this is uh, this uh, exceptional value of Net Mundial. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, then is a closing of an era and starting another uh, time, because uh, then uh, uh, we have a, a start of internet fragmentation, we have uh, new technologies like uh, Internet of Things and other things, and, and so the uh, realm of, of the internet just uh, became a more and more complex, uh, let's say. Um, and uh, still in, uh, in the present, uh, the um, criticism concerning the, the life of uh, IGFs is connected to this uh, fact of uh, not going far more than best practices. And then uh, the, 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 especially the governments that understood the importance of the internet uh, also as uh, inside the country and, and then uh, uh, having also this problem of fake news elections and things like that. So 
Um, but uh, we have to take value of what was the example of net mundial and maybe uh, to think something similar to that for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Yeah. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much, Jan Skaklinsheim with Latvian government. Um, so thank you, panelists, for, for nice uh, return in the history. I, I, uh, I felt like being present in, in, in Net Mundial, uh, so at least in, 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 in memories. Uh, further we will go, though, uh, better it will um, uh, stay in our memories, though there were some, some um, uh, let's say, difficulties uh, also in organization and in running the meeting. But of course, uh, uncontestably, that was a unique ex experiment and, and experience of really multi-stakeholder uh, decision making. Um, so my my question to panelists actually reflecting uh, on on this unique experiment and experience, why the uh, decisions uh, of Net Mondial now we are referring in the past, why they are not making the uh, uh, the presence of today. So uh, we we heard that. Uh, uh, the, the declaration which was adopted uh, basically is uh, very good. The principles are, are uh, time, timeless, as, as if I recall correctly. Uh, but we're referring to Net Mundial document uh, as a past. Not this whole second half of the session is about the future. Okay, so maybe, maybe that, that I will, I will, I will uh, get, get uh, answer to, to that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any more, more interventions? Uh, I think if this is not the case, um, uh, then uh, I hand over back to Bill, and we could start with the uh, Raul wants to make a final comment, and then uh, we start with the second part. Very short, so, so you can discuss this in the second part of the meeting. But I think one of the reasons for that, that's a very personal comment, but I, I think that we lost a momentum. Immediately after the, the Net Mundial meeting, we could have continued uh, building over the declaration and the document, and we were distracted on other things. Uh, so that's the reason because, in my view, we started to speak about the Net Mundial as a past thing. Uh, it doesn't mean that we cannot recover many of the, most of the principles included in the comments and even some aspects of the roadmap. But I think that we made some mistakes uh, after, immediately after the meeting. And probably we should not hide that, uh, you know, Fadi Shehada, who was a driver of the process, you know, went too fast and too far with the Net Mundial initiative, which was a little bit counterproductive. That means when he proposed that the World Economic Forum should overtake the implementation of the uh, Net Mundial Declaration, then he produced a lot of, uh, let's say, negative responses, uh, not only among the civil society, uh, but also other groups. So, but now, you know, with a certain distance, five years after Net Mundial, I think time is ripe to look forward. Uh, uh, Anwet and I were a member of the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace, and we used a lot of the ideas from Net Mundial if the report, which was presented just two weeks ago, go at the Paris Peace Forum uh, to the French president and the, uh, and, 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 and the, the 2,000 participants of the Paris Peace Forum. And if you look to the report of the Global Commission, you will find a number of ideas uh, from the Net Mundial. So the Net Mundial is still uh, you know, uh, on the table and has potential to guide us through the next decade and, you know, to guide us to the next 30 minutes or 60 minutes. It's now in the hand of Bill. Bill. Uh. No, no. As I said, I had a view, I told you it was contrarian, and you yeah. didn't want to hear it, so I think that's fine. Okay. Go ahead. Of course it's contrarian. It's yeah. Okay. Um, there's a really... I'm okay, my name is Avri Doria, and I'm standing up. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of wonderful stuff about Net Mundial. I think the, the whole writing exercise at the beginning was wonderful. And perhaps it's just my own perversions that made it difficult for me. But I found myself completely unable to speak at Net Mundial because there were strict divisions of lines. You need to get into a line that said you were civil society. You needed to get a line that said you were technical community or government or whatever. Now, I felt I was a hybrid. 
And I felt that there was no place. So from that point on, I basically walked all the way through Net Mundial feeling I had no voice because we got into the strict siloization. So it was really wonderful to see people standing in line and waiting their turn, but there was no place for someone that wasn't willing to say, I am this and only this. The other thing I had, it was way too governmenty. I mean, when it got to the negotiations at the end, it was governments agreed or didn't, with the business people whispering behind them as to what they could or could not agree. As I said, that was my perception. And, and, and I just, as we go on, I would say, be careful of how it works in the future. Okay, thank you for that. Nothing right. is perfect, so, uh, and it's at the end of bills now. Thank All you. All right, thank you. Can I ask Henriette and Fiona to perhaps replace two of the Team One people on the podium so that we can get your voices on the stage? Thank you, folks. No, you can stay. You're, you're part of Team Two. So we broke it up into two groups, as I said, because we wanted to do one looking back to set the context for those who were not aware around. And now we're going to do the main part, which is to think about what the Net Mondial means going forward and whether it's had any impact beyond the time. Just to review, and then I'm going to turn uh, for first question to Vint, who has, oddly has not had a chance to speak yet. I just wanted to quickly show you, for, for those of you who I put on the, um, uh, I linked on to the, the page for this session, both the Net Mundial statement, which you can download, and a book that I edited um, on the Net Mundial uh, roadmap, <clears throat> which is freely available to you if you're interested, which provides a lot of information. Uh, but for those who don't have it right in front of them, I, I want to just quickly tell you what the main elements of the Net Mundial statement were, and then we can talk about which of these has lasted, not lasted, and so on. Okay. So to start, the first half was principles. And we had principles such as, for the first time, a multi-stakeholder document, global document, that said the internet is a global resource to be managed in the public interest. It talked about human rights offline must be protected online, including a number of the key internationally protected human rights listed there. It said for the first time in any international document that I'm aware of that the internet must remain a unified and unfragmented space with security and stability, common unique identifiers, and end-to-end -end flow of lawful content. It emphasized the importance of open systems and architectures, enabling environments, uh, access, and cultural linguistic uh, diversity. And then it set out a whole series of uh, process principles for how internet governance should be conducted in the future, noting, for example, that the uh, WISIS agenda's language about uh, multi-stakeholder respective roles and responsibilities should be interpreted in a flexible manner, which is a whole different thing from what you got out of the UN-based negotiations among governments. That processes should be open, participatory, and consensus-driven, transparent, accountable, inclusive, bottom-up, yada, yada, distributed, decentralized. So these are all baselines that were set in terms of principles for how IG should be done going forward. Then we had a roadmap that set out a series of specific policy recommendations. The first set of recommendations pertain to existing mechanisms argued that the Internet Governance Forum should be strengthened, that there should be outcomes and recommendations, as we suggested in the Working Group on the Internet Governance Report in 2005, that laid out the vision for creating an IGF, that there should be renewed mandates, strengthened funding, and intersessional action, that the IANA transition that the U.S. government had just announced should be done in an open participatory way that reached beyond the ICANN community, that ICANN globalization should be pursued, in a very accountable and transparent way, taking into account all interests, et cetera. There was a principle saying that all IG organizations should implement principles for transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness and produce periodic public reports on their progress. What happened to that one? Um, then there was a set of uh, recommendations pertaining to possible new initiatives, that local, regional, and global uh, levels should have more coordination and dialogue, that technical and non-technical -commu communities should have more coordination dialogue, that there should be new coordination tools for ongoing monitoring, analysis, and information sharing functions, what some of us call the clearinghouse function, uh, that uh, multi-stakeholder mechanisms at the national level were needed, um, that there should be capacity ability and 
uh, empowerment, in particular supporting the emergence of true multi-stakeholder communities in places where that was insufficient, um, that there should be enhanced cooperation. Young man, you should appreciate this. Uh, enhanced cooperation pursued in a multi-stakeholder fashion. Uh, that we should consider mechanisms, meaning new mechanisms, for emerging topics and issues not currently addressed. And then there was a miscellaneous set of recommendations having to do with a mix of issues, cybersecurity and cybercrime, strengthened co uh, cooperation on jurisdiction and law enforcement, NLATs, et cetera. Mass surveillance should not be arbitrary and, and should be conducted in accordance with human rights law. Further consideration on some points where we couldn't reach agreement, such as roles and responsibilities, and what is the real meaning of equal footing, jurisdiction. Importantly, the idea of benchmarking applications of IG principles, um, net neutrality. And then finally, the hopeful statement that the net mundial outcomes would feed into other IG processes around the world. Um, so this was all put on paper through a collective process, and I want then to raise to the group um, the question of how do we think about which of these um, elements of this agreement that we spent the year working on have lasted, still have any meaning, uh, which have been seen follow-up and implementation, which have not, and why? Um, what lasts and is significant from this effort five years later? Vint, why don't we start with you on that point? Yeah, you can. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Bill, uh, let me start out by observing that the outcome of Net Mundial, this set of principles that we just reviewed, are still useful as a metric for future progress. So we can look at what we have accomplished, if we have accomplished something, and ask ourselves whether we've done so in a way that's still compatible uh, with the principles that uh, were set out in Net Mundial. One thing I would point out to you is that getting principles agreed is a lot easier than getting implementation of the principles. It's a little bit like law and regulation. And you could have a law that says nobody should starve in this country. Then the question will be, okay, how do we implement that? And one answer might be, well, if they can't afford to eat, we should provide them with some subsidies. Then the question will be, well, who qualifies for the subsidies? And you get into the details about what are the right levels it gets complicated very, very quickly, and there are, are a variety of different interests uh, that are affected by implementation of principles. Uh, but that it, it simply reinforces the importance of taking the principles and, and asking how well the implementation uh, has uh, maintained compatibility with those principles. Uh, the contract for the web, which is being announced, I guess, before we walked into the room, but we couldn't stay to hear more about, uh, is a good vehicle to test the Net Mundial principles against because the contract has some specifics in it that would uh, allow us to assess that. You don't make progress uh, like was made that which was made at Net Mundial without a willingness to make progress. So people in the room had to want to uh, achieve this objective as opposed to finding any way they could to stop it. So many negotiating environments are, uh, are built around the idea of preventing something from happening. And so that's something we should be very uh, watchful about because we should be about making progress, not stopping it. Now, one of the principles in there uh, and the m mantra of this IGF is about one net. Uh, Bill and I and others wrote a fairly lengthy piece about fragmentation. I'm sorry to tell you, fragmentation is here. We were not able to stop it. And we will not be able to stop it uh, because the ability to fragment the internet is available at many layers in the architecture. It can be stopped entirely by simply removing the underlying transport capability. And we already have well-worked examples in which the internet has been shut down for periods of time. So I wish that I could be more positive about avoiding fragmentation, but the answer is it's here and it will continue to be here. So our job is to try to make the network as useful as possible in spite of that and to reinforce those who want to make it a common environment and help them achieve that uh, objective while making the system as safe uh, and secure as possible. 
And that is probably our biggest challenge because now we can see how this platform can be abused. We're seeing it in the social media. Uh, we're seeing it in uh, denial of service attacks and various malware attacks and the like. We're even seeing people finding uh, day zero vulnerabilities and hoarding them and then using them uh, you know, to interfere with uh, network operation. All of those sorts of things feel like they are counter to the principles that uh, we hope to adopt uh, with NetMundial. So we have a substantial amount of work to do to preserve the value of the internet that we now know it has. And in spite of the interference uh, that we're seeing, I think we still have an opportunity to make this one of the most useful platforms ever developed. I'll stop there, Bill, thank you. And we'll come back to you in a second. So I think the key, key point you, you said relative to my question though was implementation. International uh, intergovernmental processes like the, the ITU, the WISIS can hold an annual conference to take stock of progress. There's organizational resources devoted there. There's somebody tasked with the responsibility to track. Even if some of it is kind of window dressing, it, there's a process. We adopted a set of norms here. We had nobody in place to do anything in the way of tracking progress and following up. So this became an initial limitation on the extent to which the agreement could be translated into concrete practice. But I want to turn to now first to people who haven't had a chance to speak yet, starting with Fiona, who was in a key role uh, as the, the head person for international communications in the US government at the time. At the time that we were doing this, the, you had just announced the IANA transition uh, and used the event of the Net Mundial to call attention to this and to seek international buy-in and so on. So when you think about the, the Net Mundial statement and what we agreed, what elements of that agreement have we been able to follow up on? And what have we, where have we seen progress, where have we not? Um, okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And hi to everybody. Um, so I think, um, I think Raul is the one that said um, this earlier on, that once this was out, we kind of lost the momentum because we got busy with other things. And the Anna transition item number two up here took a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of people's resources. So it was two years of pretty intensive work for people. And I think a lot of those same people would have been involved in a Net Mundial follow-up in the way that you've described it. And people can only do so much in any given day. So I think that was part of, of the, the challenge of follow-up. Um, very happily, we finished the Anna transition. And then inside the US government, we had to do our own review processes. And then uh, because of some concerns about it, we had to do another additional review of it to deal with risk frameworks. And we had to hire outside uh, evaluators to make sure that it wasn't subject to capture. And then once that was done, then we had to manage the US congressional budgeting process. And then it all ended with a lawsuit the very last day, um, which thankfully we won. But so there was a lot. There was a lot to that. And I think that sucked a lot of energy, rightly so, into something that needed to get finished. But it took a lot of the energy and momentum. And then I think, as uh, Wolfgang had said, I think the, the sort of rush to the Net Mundial initiative, uh, which we were very involved in at NTI as well, because we believed it was important to do, I think definitely didn't turn out well for, for folks. So I think that was part of the challenge. Um, you know, in terms of the four things that you have up here, I think uh, ICANN moved ahead and has tried to globalize as best as it can and continues to do so. Um, I'm reminded, um, or I try to remind myself, when I first started doing this 20 years ago, um, how different these, even these meetings are to what they used to be, that everyone can come in, there's no restrictions, everyone can talk. When we were first doing uh, the negotiations for phase one of WISIS, which was theoretically open to all stakeholders, but got kicked out of the room, um, you know, I think maybe Paul complained at by gunpoint, if I can remember correctly. So, you know, you, out of the UN be meeting. So the culmination of that with this visual of Benedictio's idea of these four lines was just this amazing you know, from a meeting where people got kicked out of the room because they couldn't speak, to the visual of people being lined up at a microphone to wait equally, always sticks with me. So the question is, how do we go forward with that? And I would say, you know, number four, I don't, I don't think much has happened with that. But these things don't happen unless people like you and us demand it. So that's, I think you've got to have the will and uh, the commitment and the energy for people to make these things happen. Otherwise, people will just continue to do what they do. So the first lesson is that implementation 
With regard to these elements, ICANN had already set up the pro or was beginning the process. Probably that would have all happened regardless of the NetMundial anyway, but the NetMundial added a political layer of uh, broader accountability that helped support the ICANN process and the globalization of ICANN, which was useful. So we saw pieces of the agreement that had specific organizations taking responsibility for particular actions, carrying through on them. But where there was not that, we got a little bit different result. Um, so, Madame, Henriette, your thoughts. What's the question? The question is which, which parts of the Mundial statement that we spent a year laboring over have been subject to any kind of real effort to follow up and do implementation, which have not, and why? Um, I think, I mean, I, I actually want to pick up on Vince's point about um, fragmentation. Um, I think some aspects has. I think certainly the human rights um, uh, um, content of the, the, um, the Net Mondial Statement has been developed, but by the human rights community, you know, perhaps more so the bodies like the Human Rights Council and the, the treaty bodies, perhaps more so than by, by internet governance. But just to explain my role, so I see Marcus Kumar is sitting in the room. I um, co-chaired the drafting of the, the principal section with Marcus, and then Jeanette and Janis Karklins co-chaired the roadmap. So that, I just want to emphasize that. I think that was an innovation that was really significant, that from the outset, we looked at both looking at principles and then also at practice and at the way forward. Um, I think that yeah, I'm not I'm not responding entirely to your question. I think that what has been said is that it, that 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 um, there has been insufficient follow up and implementation. And I think the fragmentation that that Vint is talking about is real, because there's a normative vacuum or gap. I think, and I think that's what Net Mondial came so close to filling was that very high level understanding of what are the principles that, that, that should underpin internet governance. And we still haven't got agreement on that. And I think it's extremely risky. At the moment, we're talking about regulation. Facebook is asking governments to regulate it. Um, many governments have introduced at national level some form of content regulation. There's also you know, international processes looking at that. And that really frightens me, because beginning to actually regulate the internet and those who run it and develop it and use it, when you don't have this agreement this at a principal level of what the internet is and how it should be governed, I think is a recipe for, for deepening um, um, fragmentation. So I, I think that there, I mean, I think another aspect you, you asked, well, what has um, uh, been followed up on? I think the IANA transition definitely rolled out well, but that might also be one of the reasons that the Net Mundial, one of the many reasons, but that the Net Mundial um, statement um, did not go further, because I think it was perceived by many people as public relations for the IANA transition as a way of creating political legitimacy. That was one of the critiques. Um, and so perhaps the fact that the IANA transition did work and was relatively successful also made many people feel, okay, well, maybe don't need the Net Mondial anymore. Or others who were skeptical of the Net Mondial from the outset felt, you know, why, why bother? Um, I just want to, to highlight um, just a few things which for me was very significant. The, the leadership from a developing country. I come from the Global South. I identify with, with, with Global South issues and concerns. The internet governance space is still very much dominated in many respects by the Global North. The fact that a developing country government showed the leadership to take this, initiate and take this process forward, that was immensely empowering. And if Nena was emotional, I think that was a very emotional um, feeling for, for many of us, but with good support, good support from governments in the, in the, in the global north and from other stakeholder groups. Yes, Avery is right, it was very rigidly stakeholder group, but at that time, I think that was significant. Um, and I think what the Net Mondial process did is build on the WISIS principles, and the WISIS, both the Geneva phase and the Tunis phase. Um, 
very effectively. It looked at development, inclusion, and access, open standards, for example. Um, and then it looked at, at, uh, um, at some of the security, stability, and cybercrime. And if, in fact, if you look at that document now, and I'm, I'm glad, Bull, you went through it, it was very forward-looking in terms of the issues that it identified. Um, and the other thing I think that, that I want to uh, highlight is that it wasn't easy. Consensus wasn't easy. There, was, there were moments when governments used their power. The decision-making structure of NetModel was established in such a way that um, there was a, what was it called, the high-level panel or high-level something that made final decisions. Now, some people are very skeptical of that. Executive body that had to approve the decisions. And as a drafting group, we submitted some content. For example, there was mass surveillance, there was contention on intermediary liability and intellectual property. And governments pulled rank at the end. Um, I actually think that's good. I, for me, I'm, I would much rather that we have multi-stakeholder processes which are honest, which recognize that there are different interests, different political contexts and backgrounds, and that the private sector and civil society will not always agree. And yes, if government wants to use its power, that's also okay. That's how the world works. And I think this sort of fairy tale notion of the multi-stakeholder process where we all get together and it's very... We agree on everything. I think that undermines the, both the input and the effort that people put into this as well as the outcomes. So as for just going forward, I think, as I said at the beginning, there is still this normative gap. I think um, it holds back public interest-oriented internet governance and security and stability. I think we see other bodies trying to fill that gap. The web contract, for example, we've had within the UN processes, uh, we've had the working group on enhanced cooperation, for example, and um, none of them effectively fill the gap. And I think at some point we need to agree on a normative high-level framework that should underpin multilateral and multi-stakeholder internet governance processes at national and global and regional level. And I think the fragmentation that Vint talks about is real, but I'm hoping, Vint, Vin, that we can kind of still hold it back by agreeing on some of these principles. And there's no other body, I think, that's better situated to do that than the IGF. Because ultimately, and this is, I think was a failure of the, or a weakness of the Net Mondial, it existed outside of the multilateral process. And I think for those of us that are committed to inclusive, democratic, bottom-up governance, Yes, but you cannot ultimately achieve that by also engaging governments and getting their commitment and establishing normative frameworks that will be binding to governmental actors as well as to non-governmental actors. We don't have that yet. The Net Mondial brought us close. We need to develop that. I think the IGF still remains the, the most appropriate space for that. Thank you for that, Henriette. I'm sure that the idea that it was a good thing that at the end of the day, governments pulled rank, and the whole question of what do we really mean by equal footing is something that maybe we might want to take up in the, in the larger discussion. Okay, uh, let's turn then to Jeanette, who was also playing a central role in the, what was your, what were you again on the, one of those committees? I forget. You were in one of these. You were the co-chair. You were the co-chair of the meeting, right? Okay, fine. So you must have a few views on what's been done and what hasn't been done. Thank you, Bill. Um, when I looked at the principles and the roadmap again, the first thing I noticed is that some of the principles, in my view, have aged a bit. For example, this idea of permissionless innovation. It was controversial then, but now I would say it's pretty much discredited, and we wouldn't put this in a document anymore. And the same concerns perhaps this idea of intermediary liability limitations. We have them, but we continue, or let's say governments continue to restrict these limitations. Um, so we would probably uh, put this in a different way today too. But what I find actually quite interesting, uh, go to 11 again, the one I want to talk about, 11, um, 
Here we go. The, uh, the emerging topics. What I noticed over the last years is that emerging topics are being taken up by internet governance processes only in a very reduced way. My feeling is that attention is more and more shifting from critical resources and infrastructure issues to platforms. Platforms is the big thing at the moment. Governments get really interested among them, the European Commission in regulating platforms. And what I also noticed is that there are more and more civil society initiatives taking up platforms. For example, the issue of freedom of speech. There are networks emerging in the US that deal with this, but none of them are connected in any way uh, to the internet governance, people, actors, processes that are in place so far. Many people looking at these issues are not even aware of processes such as Net Mondial. So we seem to reinvent uh, the wheel here in this field and thereby also learning anew how to deal with this. We see Facebook coming up with this uh, oversight board. We see civil society uh, um, and networks emerging on these issues, but they're completely decoupled uh, from what we've done in the traditional internet governance field, and that I think is really a problem. Not only that we don't build on this, also the sort of normative issues are gone. Um, and I think particularly in terms of human rights, uh, that is really a problem. Thank you. So then, just to synthesize a little bit and then turn to the next question and get some others in, into the discussion as well, if we look at the principles, among, many of these principles that were articulated back then, some have been followed up in other bodies, in Human Rights Council, things like that in varying degrees. Not with strong reference to the Net Mondial as a guide, but nevertheless, there's been some movement going forward. Some of the other issues that were listed as principles, basically there's no institutional nexus that has done anything in particular uh, to advance those principles or to measure compliance with those principles. Um, and I think that that's been an ongoing sort of issue. Uh, and then when we look at the, the things that were in the roadmap, those parts that spoke to specific organizations that were already in place, had budgets, had staff, had processes in place like ICANN, things move forward. Other things where we were making a recommendation to the world that the world ought to, ought to do something, nothing happened. So even the IGF, which there is a mechanism, has spent the past decade talking about how to strengthen outputs and do intercessional stuff, and not much has really strongly come out of that. There is intercessional work, but not enough. Um, nobody has done implementing principles for transparency and accountability, which is something that we put in, it was in the WISIS principles as well. And, that the, and we put into the IGF mandate that the IGF would be a place that would monitor on an ongoing basis implementation of, these, of WIS's principles. That didn't happen. All the new initiatives type things that people talked about launching back then for expanded coordination, creation of new tools. There were some little bits of effort to create some, you know, you had various uh, efforts to do experimentally with some tools under Net Mondial Initiative and the European one. Diplo Foundation, but not a lot has been done there yet. Uh, most of these other areas, there has not really been significant follow-up. And on the miscellaneous issues, those are all being pursued in different bodies in varying ways without real reference to the Net Mondial Initiative. So as a general rule, you'd have to say Net Mondial may have had some normative input into some other processes, but there has not been really, as, tell me if I'm wrong. If anybody disagrees with me, that's great. I don't see really sustained activity to try to do it, and I think that's a pity. Vint, tell me I'm wrong. This is not necessarily a, to disagree with you at all. First, I want to disagree with Jeanette. Uh, so I figure I'll pick on you first. Uh, I don't agree with you that permissionless innovation is discredited, but I think that what you mean by it and what I mean by it might be different. From my point of view as an engineer, the architecture of the internet is still wide open in terms of uh, allowing people to invent new protocols at all layers in the architecture, to invent new applications. The place where I suspect you might come out is that uh, you can't get away with doing anything you want to do in terms of potential harm to users, uh, exposure of private information. That 
uh, I think is a constraint which is increasing. So let me give you a concrete example of a trend which I think is becoming very visible, and that's transparency, the demand for transparency in many different dimensions, whether it's the algorithms that are used in artificial intelligence and machine learning, or practices that have to do with the way in which data uh, is being uh, consumed and used, or protected or not protected. So we can at least count on some aspects of the Net Mondial starting to influence the way in which regulatory thinking is, uh, is emerging. And I think we should be happy about that. Jeanette, did you want to react to that? Um, I fully agree with you. I took care of that problem. You know, the part of the problem, I think, is that for a lot of people, permissionless innovation blurred into break fa move fast and break things. And in Europe, in particular, there's more of an ex-ante regulatory precautionary principle kind of approach mm -hmm. that people tend to think, you know, don't just launch into things until you have some idea what's going to happen. And American entrepreneurs are like, hell, let's just see what happens, which, you know, hasn't always been the, the best word for it. Uh, Henriette, did you want to get in? And then also, well, I, let's see, if any of the other panelists want to respond to... Well, uh, just to respond to your question, I think that, that yes, there is no formal uh, follow-up process. I think at a, at a more subtle and nuanced level, however, I think that there is a legacy. Net Montreal has a legacy that, 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 sh that is significant. And I think the, the, the opening panel, the opening section of this panel speakers actually highlighted that. I think the, the I think, but where there is follow up and, and building on, on the Net Mondial, it, because it's so institutionally fragmented, it doesn't help us to address the fragmentation in internet governance. Take, for example, the, the UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators, which is a set of metrics that, that allow for a multi-stakeholder approach at national level to, to understand how universal access to the internet is, how secure and stable, um, how gender aware, um, how social justice aware. This is a set of metrics that, that I think, um, who talked about SON, Raul? No, not, That's Nena, it. Nena. Spirit. The spirit of Net Mondial, I think, really informs those UNESCO indicators. They're a very powerful tool, but it's one UN agency um, whose member states have, have uh, adopted these or encouraged that this is being used. It's, it's, and it's doing so based on indicators, not necessarily, and on UNESCO's own normative framework, which is the Rome framework, which is rights, openness, access, and multi-stakeholder. So, so yes, the legacy is there, but I think it's up to the IGF because it's so unique in that it's open and inclusive and connected to the multilateral system. It's connected to the UN, so it is connected to this institutional framework where governments still feel at home. And that's the challenge. I think we have to deal with that challenge. And, and every, if it, even if it does mean having separate queues for governments, I do think that that's, that's still what the IGF can and should do. And I think the, the fact that Net Mondial came so close should really be an inspiration to us, actually, that, that we can build that kind of common, high-level uh, understanding and roadmap. Uh, uh, I want to recall what uh, Avri Doria said about the little four boxes, uh, government, civil society, academia, etc. Uh, I don't say etc. I say private sector. <laughs> uh, this, uh, when we uh, prepared the document of uh, the Marco Civil, this took uh, from 2009 to 2014, from the first draft to the sanction by the federal government you know, in the Net Mundial event. It was a participation very broad, open, transparent, etc., of all sectors. You know? And uh, when Dilma was to sign the document, there was a strong manifestation from some sectors of civil society claiming that she should not sign it at the time. So this is to demonstrate that the, the, this, these four boxes don't fit everything. 
the governments diverged, uh, at least two governments, three governments were strongly opposed to the process and to the content produced by Net Mundial. Uh, and when they were pres present there. And uh, the civil society has its tendencies and its, their approaches and very strong divisions, no? And obviously the other sectors too. So it's very difficult to carry out a multi-stakeholder process trying to contemplate all these nuances, all these, these uh, differences, and arrive at a consensus. By the way, the, the Brazilian organizations that were opposed to the Marco Civil at the time now strongly defend it, given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nana, did you have any thoughts on the, what came out of this? I mean, how do we think about it after a few years in terms of what yeah. impacted, what didn't? I wanted to come back to, I think, principle number two. Uh, uh, rights of, on, offline should be also the same as rights online. And uh, it, it, in the days of Net Mundial, it was, it, it was there. And for people who live in the global north, it doesn't mean anything for them. But if you live in Africa as an activist, and you know how many drives, how many bills want to regulate ABC, um, Nigeria is actually in the process of adopting one that says death by hanging for hate speech. Hate speech which can mean that you do not agree with a top government official. Nobody has been hanged in, hung in Nigeria for dilapidating public funds. But someone who writes something on Twitter can be hung for that. But my point is, if you are coming from where I come from, and you have to fight on daily basis against multiple bills everywhere coming up, they want to regulate. In fact, there was one that wanted to regulate just WhatsApp. I mean, what the fuck? Are we, are we there? <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but <laughs> I am not offended. I assure some, you. Sometimes you have to call bullshit by its name, okay? But you know, when when you have these laws mushrooming every day, but by people who want to hold tight to things that should have been in the open space in the first place, you realize that the spirit of Net Mundial is with some of us who keep saying there isn't anything new in what is happening online, and we have laws that already govern offline life that can be applied online, and we do not need to invest taxpayers' money into new legislative processes that wouldn't lead us anywhere. So I, I believe that that is one thing uh, that uh, we took from the spirit of Net Mundial. You may not see Net Mundial cited, but I think this is one thing. I also want to pay homage to the gentleman over there who was, representing <laughs> who was representing Brazil in all those years through the oasis, and these two here. And I'm happy that they are still together. I mean, together as in still passionate about this. And it tells us something, uh, that Brazil led in Net Mondial, which is a follow-up to its lead in Marco Civil, has put Brazil somewhere that they now, everybody is interested in what is happening in Brazil. You may not know this, but if there's any digital rights issue, we, we want to know, we want to analyze it. And that brings me to my point, the point of having leadership in specific areas, which is what the IGF is yet to give us, because the system is not that way built. Um, Europe has taken leadership in GDPR, who else will take leadership in what? Uh, at the time of Net Mundial, we were not talking much about artificial intelligence, but I think these days it is becoming bigger. So my, I have two points there. The one, the, the principle that says offline rights also apply to online has helped us as people who fight for human rights from the global south, fighting various bills on daily basis. And the fact that there was leadership from Brazil um, has put a kind of um, digital responsibility on that country, and we are hoping for digital leaders in other issues. Okay. I'm done. And I'm going to pay homage to that gentleman right now, but before I do, I just want to ask you then, in Africa, have you ever seen governments reference the Net Mondial uh, statement 
as providing a rationale for any action or justifying any activity? Um, I have seen countries take on uh, more organization around their, their equivalent of CGI. I, I have seen that. Okay. So I've seen countries that said we need to sit and we need to look at what Brazil has done. If you recall, after Net Mundial, we invited somebody from Brazil to West Africa IGF. And she had, we arranged a lot of bilaterals with governments. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, the Nigerian government was coping the uh, national IGF. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a lot of talk. And Nigeria actually started what looks like it will last as a national IGF, and that which, for which we are proud of. So like I said, we may not call it net mundial, mm -hmm. but the spirit of it is there. Okay. Because as we all remember, too, after we adopted this thing and all thought we had done this wonderful thing, in all the intergovernmental settings where somebody tried to raise it, the industrialized democracies would always keep, try to put net mundial language in, and the G77 would always take it out. In the, with the WISIS 10, all the, the, the UN agencies really were resistant to having much acknowledgement of the net mundial legitimizing it as a, would you like but, to correct but me? Just to, just to, absolutely true, but the reason for that was not because they did not necessarily agree with the contents of the net mundial statement no. or the net mundial roadmap, but because they felt that the issue of enhanced cooperation in the Tunis agenda, which is code for the role of governments, wasn't addressed effectively. Yeah. So it was, it, it, it's an example of how the success of a multi-stakeholder process um, became a kind of a deal breaker in the multilateral process. But there was also disquiet with the fact that the decision making had been multi-stakeholder. And if you remember at the end of the meeting, India, Russia, and other governments got up and said, on a process ground, this is not acceptable. We are not gonna legitimate this as a way to go forward. Absolutely, and there were several African um, countries who would have held that position, but there were also those that who endorsed the statement. But the spirit of Net Mondial, by the way, some of the language you will find in the African Union Commission's Declaration on Internet Governance, which followed shortly afterwards. So the spirit lives on, but the document itself has a soft, diffuse normative effect. Let's hear from somebody who is centrally involved, who several people have uh, pointed to, and that is Ambassador Fonseca, who played a central role in pulling all this together from Brazil. Thank you, Bill, and uh, well, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, however, I should start with a disclaimer because I, my participation in this meeting has a totally different uh, nature of before. Uh, as a diplomat, I have moved uh, on to another job. I am now the, the Consul General of Brazil in Boston. I hope to see you, many of you there at some point in time. Uh, in Boston, yeah, in Boston, yeah, sorry? Nice conference in Boston. Yes, ah, very good, excellent. <laughs> Uh, but this is to say that I, anything I say does not represent the Brazilian government position anymore. I'm not entitled to this anymore. Actually, my successor, Ambassador Achilles, uh, he is in, in, the, in town. He'll be here for, I think not today, I think he has a cybersecurity summit. Uh, He's on a panel this yes, but, uh, oh yeah, um, but he'll be here. So he is the one who could speak. So my comments, uh, anyway, they reflect the uh, a few years I have dedicated myself to this uh, with uh, passion. <laughs> I think I remain uh, passionate about this and uh, my memory is still good in regard to what happened in Net Mundial. So I'd like to make uh, a few comments. Uh, first of all, I'm very proud of having been part of the team who organized Net Mundial uh, together with the Brazilian uh, uh, CGI. Uh, uh, I see here many colleagues from CGI and it's a great pleasure Hartmut Glaser, Carlos Afonso, and others, uh, in, in partnership with other uh, institutions and organizations. And, and I think one of the points I'd like to make is that the outcome of Net Mundial, with both its success and shortcomings, uh, 
I, I think all of this was larger than the, the sum of the parts. I think I have heard uh, reference to the work of the, of that was done by Fadi. I think it was very important at the beginning when Fadi approached our president and, and they agreed to convene Met Mundial and then the pres President Dilma itself, her role in uh, uh, convoking this meeting, uh, CGI working within its network and the other organizations. Uh, but everything in relation to the organization and to the realization of Net Mundial went far beyond individual participation. Just to give an example, and it's not a criticism to Fadi, who is a good friend, uh, uh, he sometimes wanted to move too fast. <laughs> For example, when we said uh, we want to have representatives from civil society, we said, no, so we can invite uh, one, two, B, and, right. and, and we said, no, no, that's not the way civil society operates. Uh, we must leave them to choose their uh, representatives. It's not up to us to choose. It's not up to us to say how they are going to organize bottom-up. It's up to them. Uh, but it takes time. Well, it takes the time, we don't have much time, but we should give them enough, otherwise it will not be legitimate. Just to say part of the things that were in backstage that are not uh, particularly secretive, but I think that's led. Because we were listening to each other, we were building on what uh, others said. <clears throat> the strengths of Net Mundial, it showed the possibility of coming together in a multi-stakeholder fashion and produce uh, concrete outcomes. Uh, it showed that uh, we, from the perspective of governments, and I am 100% uh, government, uh, it shows that it's possible to be creative, you know, that we are not obliged to, we are not tied to the, the procedure, the rules of procedures. We can be innovative, provided we give people comfort of what they are doing. And in regard to follow-up, I think it's also a strength. Even what happened later on in ICANN, uh, and I take the point that was made by Bill that those things were, in a way, already in progress. Uh, and maybe uh, it would be maybe a bit presumptuous to say that because of Net Mundial, the ICANN transition took place. But I think Net Mundial played a role to that. That was even acknowledged by uh, Larry Strickling and others that Net Mundial did provide, let's say, the impetus or the momentum for that to happen. And if in Net Mundial, uh, I think it was maybe the first uh, occasion in which there was a discussion on how to move forward uh, in that regard. Uh, also, I would mention the Internet and Jurisdiction Project that was also mentioned in, uh, as one of the areas that needed to move forward, and we are very glad to see that uh, this uh, important area uh, has been moving forward again. Uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle's project was already there, but I think uh, Net Mundial uh, also gave a push to that. But I have to go to the weaknesses of Net Mundial. And uh, I take the point made by Avri Dori, I think, uh, and others that we have, in a way, to work in silos. And I think it was unavoidable to do that because we had little time and we had a, a a goal in mind we wanted to achieve, and we had little time, so we had, in a way, to, to push a little bit everyone. <laughs> we pushed governments to be there, because if we acted uh, by the rule in regard to government participation, they would not be there in a way, because we would need to make a, a resolution asking for that to happen, and that would be negotiated. It was just, let's invite those people to come, and they came. So, but... Uh, uh, I think that was part of the issues we, <coughs> we had to face. Uh, but then I, I'd like, in regard to governments, to build a little bit on what uh, Henriette said, because I think that when we think about the weak points of Net Mundial, I think Net Mundial was very important, was a unique thing. It produced many important things. The, it, it's a landmark that will remain. But we cannot say, we cannot not over uh, emphasize the importance of Net Mundial. Uh, and one of the weaknesses was the involvement of governments. I recall, maybe some of you recall that at the last session of Net Mundial, a number of countries, uh, they stood up and they said, we reject this document. We do not accept this document. We are not taking this forward. And it was for us, uh, for Brazil, uh, for the Brazilian government in particular, backlash. But we understand why they did that. As he had said, it's not basically not because of the content itself. I think 
even for governments, the content there could be, if there was an opportunity to work a little bit around it, they could accept. Uh, just for give an example, when we were negotiating with this plus 10 documents, uh, and then we have a diverse group, including from Ambassador uh, Sepulveda to colleagues from uh, Saudi Arabia and others and Cuba, and all, all the world was there. And we came out, out with a document that was good. We extended IGF for a number of years. We made things that remain also a landmark. So that, but this was following a procedure that, uh, unfortunately, uh, in regard to Net Mundial, uh, there was not time to do that. But I think that maybe have a lo we had a lost opportunity, maybe after that Net Mundial, to try to embed it in the uh, multilateral uh, setting. Uh, it, it is not easy. When this was taken up by the Assembly General, uh, I recall we could not even welcome the document. Countries are not prepared to welcome because welcome takes, uh, I think it, the expression was used, takes note, which is something we know it's there and we move on. Uh, and I, I think this reflects also, uh, I, one comment I'd like to make, and I'm moving to my last point. <laughs> Uh, the lessons we have learned. That the first and most important lesson is that the multi stakeholder process to be not to go to move beyond discussions to good, it must reflect, respect each stakeholder group's culture, its way of doing things. Uh, government should respect civil society, civil society should also respect governments. And I, I'm sorry to, I, I know I'm being a bit provocative, but I. Since I'm not uh, speaking, I'm uh, on a personal capacity, so I can say anything. And as we move, uh, we grow older, and uh, we approach a retirement. I I'll be retired in 19 years, <laughs> so uh, I'm approaching retirement uh, quickly. By the way, when the law was changed in Brazil, extending from 70 to 75, I was very happy. And I said to my wife, I, I have five years more to work. And she said, are you crazy? Uh, we <laughs> I don't want to enjoy life after you finish work. I said, I'm enjoying life now, and, <laughs> and I hope to be enjoying with you. But uh, I, I, I want to be very brief because I, I know the time is limited and I don't want to abuse the time. Uh, so respect for each group. Uh, we, we should not, and, and this is a message I'd like to leave for uh, colleagues at IGF, because I know here civil society, academia, uh, private sector are here together with governments, and I personally I am convinced of the value of doing this. Uh, I am a strong advocate for this model, but you should not ignore, and again, the way governments do things. It is unrealistic to think that anything that will be done here will be automatically taken up by government. This will not be the case. If there is not an opportunity for governments to come together in according to rules or procedure that they are comfortable, uh, they will not be prepared to take it up. Because governments, and I, I'm government, we are accountable to our, we receive instructions, and we have to make reports, and we have to show that what we are doing, what we accept is in line with the overall. So I think it's possible to move beyond the normal way of doing things. IGF was created in the UN context and represents something different from what we have there. I think we can expand this, uh, but that should, the respect should be there. And uh, the final point is that I think it's important to reflect uh, uh, on the legacy of Net Mundial, also because there is a lot of areas in which clearly there is unfinished business, as uh, you went through, Bill. There's so many areas that when you look, they, they are still valid, valid areas in which we, also, we need to expand, but from 2014 to today, not much has happened. So it's important to, to revisit the spirit of Net Mundial, but with a very, I would say, outcome-oriented, and in that, I think all those aspects should be taken into account. So I, my message for you is, okay, I think it's important. Uh, I'm proud to have him be part, but let's move beyond Net Mundial. Net Mundial, in a way, was unique. I don't think it's worthwhile to repeat again the same uh, methodology. With, maybe we should work in, uh, in a more targeted way, because I think the, the, this idea of having provided a conscience of what needs to be done is already there. We need to move to implementation. And in that regard, I think it's very important that stakeholder groups 
should uh, be very much respectful of each other's way of doing things, respect the culture, and make sure that the decisions will be not only please ourselves and, uh, uh, and we have the impression we are changing the world by doing things here, but in, in, especially in regard to what governments are doing, the impact is not there. So this should be revisited. Thank you very much. Apologies for taking so long. Thank you, Benedicto. It was very helpful. We need to be respective of the clock. Uh, we have uh, 15 minutes left. I know people here want to engage. So I had a couple more questions I wanted to ask. Let me just ask for very concise responses uh, from colleagues on, on team two, and then we'll go open the floor. And that is, number one, as we look at all these new initiatives that are being put forward, and we've talked about them, main lesson that you would learn from the Net Mundial for making these things more successful. Um, is there anything we can draw from this experience about how do you do normative work to try to make it have some teeth be useful? And then secondly, how might the Net this is my personal interest, how might the Net Mundial process be useful in reimagining the IGF going forward? We have, a, we have a whole main session tomorrow on IGF plus and the proposal from the Guterres panel, which has a lot of interesting bells and whistles on it. What it doesn't have is a mechanism that would do the kind of thing that we did at Nutmundial, perhaps, which, by the way, the ITU does, in a way, with its World Telecom Policy Forum. They took a few specific issues. They do a, a year-long consultation process. They have versions of the document, and then they have a meeting. It's, that's intergovernmentalism plus. But nevertheless, the point is there are models out there to draw on. So how, how could we make use of what we've learned from NetMundial in doing these next kinds of initiatives? And what could be, what if anything could it mean for the IGF? Let's turn to you first, Ind. So uh, let me be uh, brief. Uh, first of all, I think NetMundial was uh, successful because it was a coalition of the willing. And so if we're going to learn anything at all for IGF Plus, for example, it is to discover uh, what people are actually willing to commit to. Uh, the second thing that I would urge is that uh, the tracking idea that was in uh, the Net Mundial uh, principles uh, find its way into IGF Plus, because unless we are willing to pay attention to whether we're making progress or not, uh, we won't make very much progress. So we have to hold ourselves accountable for trying to uh, move the whole internet governance process forward. And that idea is in the WISIS principles, which governments agreed to. Um, I, th I think I um, would strongly agree with Vint that you have to have a coalition of the willing um, if you're going to try to do this kind of thing or take anything forward. Um, the Net Mundial experience is one that I had never experienced as a government official, and I think that even for the United States at the time, it wasn't comfortable all the time. And we got a lot of questions back at home, and I'm still surprised Honoriette and I are still friends after that last <laughs> negotiation <laughs> session where governments kind of usurped her group. I'm sorry, but I was doing my job. Um, so I think um, you know. I think I would. The question I would ask back to you, and maybe to the folks here, is: well, What is it you're trying to do? Do we need to have another conversation where we reinforce the principles that we've already done? I would say the WISIS principles from 2003, 2005 hold up pretty well. These principles hold up fairly well. I agree with Jeanette. There's a few things. Um, I mean, intermediaries are the big issue of the day that don't work. But if you're trying to move towards actually solving people's problems and actually addressing the concerns that people have about what, what the internet can and can't do for them, you've got to have people that agree to do something. You've got to, I think things are successful when you have a clearly defined problem set. It can't be everything under the sun or people get too distracted. And you have to have funding. And without those three things, I think it's hard to move some of this forward. I wanted to, to draw attention to what the, the UN high-level panel on digital cooperation has done in holding consultations across. And I think that is one thing um, we, we developed from NetMundial. And the contract for the web that has just launched took a lot, I, I can tell you as an insider, from the process of the NetMundial, of having working groups, of putting out a draft of having people um, comment on 
line per line of the draft, and, and that was actually very instructive for me during the Net Mundial, and I think we've applied that here. Uh, so beyond having people at the, round, at the table as multi-stakeholder, I'm actually looking at multi-stakeholder input into the process that leads to uh, a product. Um, I think that the, the, the um, I think the fact that it was a multi-stakeholder process that made the decision, as opposed to just multi-stakeholder process into a decision, is actually an important, unique uh, um, characteristic of NetMondial that I think should be retained. I think it's not going to be easy, but I think that at a very high level, we need international principles. We need to take the WISIS principles as a starting point, but build on them, making them a little bit more elaborate. And that's what we did with NetMondial. Maybe we can be a little bit more minimalist about that. Um, uh, the NetMondial statement starts with the sentence, the internet is a global public resource. I think just getting international agreement on that for me, would be a breakthrough in terms of underpinning internet governance and policy decisions at national industry, international level. And I think that can then um, help us get less fragmentation. I think the other lesson is just that we do, I mean, I, in, in fact, I have a slightly different view, again, sorry, Fiona, um, on the coalition of the like-minded. I think we've it's got to... Willing. willing, oh yes, you're right. Co coalition of the willing, yes, but not coalition of the like-minded. There's a tendency in multi-stakeholder processes to stay in the comfort zone of the like-minded and not work through the challenges of dissent and different views and opinions. Sorry, we agree, actually, and that is why we're still friends. <laughs> one of the reasons, one of the many. All right, Jeanette, you get to wrap it up, and then we're going to do what we can to get voices in the room. Yeah, I'd like to comment on the coalition of the willing. At that time, I had um, the impression that this coalition came together because of a serious legitimacy crisis. Uh, that convinced lots of governments to sort of get out of their comfort zone and do things they might not have done otherwise. And that also secured some support by the private sector. And I hope I'm wrong that we need these kind of crises to sort of do these innovative processes. That is an interesting place to stop. We've got 10 minutes. I know there's a lot of people here. Uh, please be, introduce yourself, be concise. If you're asking a question to somebody in particular, make sure that they understand that. If you're just making an intervention, that's fine. We'll go till uh, 13.05 and then they'll throw us out of the room. Hi, Enzo Pugliatti from ISOC Italy. Uh, the question is uh, how we can go from theory to practice and make it happen, especially when we move from the glo global to the local or the national level, uh, so the role of NRI. In spite of all we have heard and we know, and Carlos told us uh, of the difficulties they faced in Brazil, at the end you had an ideal scenario where all the components were there. Government support, role of the of the civil society funding through the registry and so on. Not all countries are facing a similar environment. I come from Italy where uh, we had the national IGF where it, that was so inclusive that kicked, that, kicked us out as uh, ISOC uh, um, board member because we didn't agree with something. And this, it's, a, it's an IGF, uh, it's a national IGF. Uh, today we had, uh, for the first time, a minister attending the global IGF, uh, an Italian minister, and I think this is great. It's a big opportunity, but uh, we don't have a, a strong unified government approach. We have different bodies and so on. So how we can cope? How can we cope with situation in such environment? It's a simple question that probably doesn't, uh, that does require a complex answer, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thank you, Bill. Actually, I was part of the executive multi-stakeholder committee that participated in the organization of Net Mundial, so I had the pleasure 
to work with um, many of you, and it was indeed a lifetime experience. My question to you brings the point that Jeanette mentioned in the end. Um, when Net Mondial happened, it was a moment of almost breaking of relationships. Countries were accusing each other publicly. They were talking about building cables to diversify infrastructure. Brazil had the idea to launch its own national mailing system, so we, would, we wouldn't use Google anymore. So Net Mundial showed us in that in a moment of very acute crisis, we have a constructive path forward. So the key thing to me is that we proved that we don't need to resort to fragmentation. We don't need to shut down dialogue. If bad things happen, we have a framework that show us how we can build dialogue and move forward. In your views, is there anything that you see coming up in the future that could mean a crisis that would lead us to call a second edition of Net Mundial? And just a quick comment that uh, Daniel Fink, myself, uh, and Nicolas Ingales, we wrote a case study on Net Mundial for Harvard after the meeting. So the step-by-step -step of the organization of the meeting and some of the lessons learned are documented there. If you are interested, that's a good starting point if you want to know more about the meeting. Thank you very much. So actually, Fiona wanted to respond to the gentleman from Italy, and then anybody who wants to respond to Marilia, please do. Sure. Other questions? So to answer the, the first question, I think, um, even in the United States where you have lots of different parts of the government that do different pieces, and even Congress does other things, at NTIA we tried to actually live the multi-stakeholder model and propose processes and ways to do that. So, you know, we would convene these uh, multi-stakeholder processes domestically, which is c completely contrary to how Washington, D.C. works. Everybody goes and lobbies Congress, gets laws passed, and gets one of the regulators to do something. So my answer to you would be to try to find your part of the government that believes in what you believe in and go work with them. Yeah. Wait, oh, wait, sorry. Uh, responses to Marilia. Yes. Um, First of all, I would observe, uh, don't waste a crisis, uh, because it really was a crisis uh, that, uh, that drove a lot of the net mundial situation. People wanted to deal with the crisis. Um, I was going to suggest a tactic that we should pay attention to. Internet governance is not going to work very well unless you take into account the transnational nature of the network and the businesses that it, is, uh, that it has spawned. And transnational activity means cooperation at the uh, multilateral level. So we're going to need governments to work together in order to fashion a multinational, transnational regime to allow these uh, multinational companies to function in the way which everyone seems to want. Okay. Um, actually, before we go to the next in room, I forgot about the online people. We have a question from online. Yes, the question is why should permissionless innovation be taken out of the document or redefined or clarified? Uh, in other words, if there are abuses of this principle, the trouble with the principle needs to be addressed. Clarify the damn thing. <laughs> At that time, the sort of spirit in the private sector was, let's innovate and see what uh, the law says has to say about this later. And this emphasis on innovation at the cost of the regulatory framework, existing regulatory frameworks of markets, that has changed. Um, I don't know who it was, perhaps... It's changed. I mean, I was at the West Coast two or three weeks ago, and my feeling is it's changing. I can see employees of the IT industry getting really depressed about the reputation they have at the moment. That Mark Zuckerberg travels Europe and asks for regulation because he has created something that is beyond his own means to set the rules for. That, has, that, reflects, that reflects a change that we could not see five years ago. I see really a sort of change of tide at the moment. Uh, not some, I mean, I'm, it sounds sort of more positive uh, than I mean it. I don't, I'm not really happy with this idea of now let's regulate content. It is a very difficult thing and it uh, sort of affects potentially negatively uh, human rights, particularly those of freedom of speech. So I see a real danger here, but what I mean to say that we 
wouldn't put the principle as permissionless innovation as unqualified anymore in a document as we did at that time. So just, just to suggest that there is a crisis here, the, the nature of the crisis is that uh, if there is going to be any kind of regulation relating to product, service, and content, what you would prefer is something more or less uniform as opposed to 193 countries worth of regulation, all diverse. And so the crisis is, which I think Zuckerberg and others are recognizing, is that if we're going to have regulation, then we ought to have coherent regulation as opposed to incoherent regulation. Okay, we have almost no time left, but we have two people who want to ask questions, so let's just try to be as concise as possible and then I'll wrap it. So. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Jan, uh, public, law, public international law researcher from the University of Hamburg. Um, in my research, I look at transnational spaces, uh, the deep sea, outer space, yeah, which are the common heritage of humanity, and how they are regulated, and compare that to internet governance. And uh, one thing why I'm so incredibly thankful for the Net Mundial uh, statement, because I think it condensed core values, core principles of internet governance. And I'd be interested to hear how in the field of institutions uh, we can progress. Like the Net Mundial statement being a kind of um, constitutional document, yeah, one of the constitutional documents of the internet for the principles. And where's the progression on institutions? Do we need a stronger interaction maybe of the Internet Governance Forum and the UN? Do we need more? public international law on, on the topic, that would be my question. And I hand over to the next. Thank you very much. Hi, Igor Ostrowski from IGF Poland. Um, I love what, Andriet, you, you said, and I fully agree that it's time to uh, freshen up the principles and maybe put some more meat on it. There's probably not much um, we can do right now, but actually IGF is coming to Poland in uh, next year and maybe um, we can start thinking about actual actions and what we can do. Um, so all I wanted to, um, to ask is uh, not to uh, lose this opportunity and if we can somehow put the, this into the words and then into action um, and in a, to, to do something concrete so that when we meet in a year we don't spend it, we're not in the same space I, I, would, I would be a very happy man. Excellent. All right, listen, I want to thank everybody for staying in this hot room for two hours after lunch, trying to digest and process all this information at the same time. I think we covered a good deal of ground, and I think we drew some important... If nobody's listening to me, I won't talk anymore. Okay. Uh, I think we, we drew some important lessons that normative agreements, multi-stakeholder agreements, can be useful and do have a diffuse impact, but in order to translate into something concrete, we need to have institutional commitments and foci to be able to pick things up. It's not enough to just have declaratory statements that say the world ought to do X. We, have, we need statements that say actors X, Y, and Z should do, and, and so on. So we need to be more specific. But anyway, I think we've we moved the ball forward. This helps to set up the discussion of the other proposals that are on the table for this meeting. I thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>